Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Allison Adcox. I'm the Director of Learning and Resources at NAO, and I want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for today's session, Maximizing Loan Forgiveness Under the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, thank you so much for your patience. We got a little bit of a late start. We had some technical difficulties because banks have really good firewalls, so thank you for your patience. I'm going to breeze through the introductions as quickly as I can so that we can hand it over today to today's experts. Um, we are thrilled to have three amazing subject matter experts with us today to speak on this topic, providing insight from the banking perspective. We have Lisa Faust. Lisa is the Senior Vice President and Relationship Banking Team Leader at Pacific West Bank. And we also have Robert Countryman who's joining us by phone, so you won't be able to see him, but you will be able to hear him. Robert is the market president for Portland and Seattle at First Interstate Bank. And finally, moderating today's se session, we have Leslie Bennett. Leslie is a senior financial consultant with CFO Selections and has helped quite a few nonprofits navigate the application process and brings with her today the practitioner perspective that can give voice to a lot of the questions and challenges we know that nonprofits are having with the forgiveness process. This programming... Great. Oh, sorry, I have just a couple more things, sorry. <laughs> this programming would not be possible without the support of our funders, so we want to give a big thank you to our funders and our corporate sponsors as well. And we can move on to today's, I'm going to show you our agenda really quickly here. This is the agenda that Leslie is going to moderate our discussion through. There's not going to be a lot of information in the slide deck. We're going to send you materials after the fact so that you can look through those detailed um, materials. And this is really an opportunity to have a discussion between our content experts, Leslie, and all of you who are in the audience today. Next slide. You're welcome to enter any questions that you have into the Q&A. You'll see an icon over to the right-hand side of your screen. Um, just know that we won't be answering those questions until the end of the session. We're going to have a facilitated Q&A towards the end. That being said, a lot of the questions that you all have will probably be answered during the course of the session. And some questions will just remain unanswered because we're all navigating the uncertainty with this process. So I'll, I'll leave you finally with a little bit of a disclaimer that today's session is really for informational purposes. It's not intended to be a substitute for legal or tax advice for your specific situation, and I'm sure the presenters will also flag that for you in any of the places where we're still holding um, expectation that we'll hear more from the SBA and see more from, um, from the federal government on what they're going to do. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Leslie Bennett. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. We are going to just dive right into our first topic, which is timeline considerations. And Lisa Faust will walk us through some of that. And then I'm going to follow up with some general questions that I think folks may have. Lisa? Thank you, Leslie. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I will put that disclaimer out again right now <laughs> that we are in somewhat of a holding pattern as banks. So at the present time, the SBA portal did open up on August 10th to submit PPP forgiveness applications. Many, if not all, banks will be holding back at the present time before they start submitting applications for a couple of di different legislative items we're still waiting on. Uh, one of those is um, an automatic forgiveness for PPP loans under the threshold of 150000 so we're waiting on that. If that does get passed, it would, I think, cover many of our uh, community nonprofits where minimal amount of documentation will be required along with the application. So it'll save time for the borrower and the lender um, in that process. Um, in addition, for those over 150,000 to 2 million, there's also considerations in the proposal uh, um, in Congress to streamline and reduce the paperwork required based on the current guidance we had as of the opening of the portal for August 10th. Um, so we have those major pieces that we're waiting on. Um, but there's also more guidance coming in about potentially, um, you know, will there be extra resources available to those different industries that need it? 
Um, could they expand on the amount of loan that they received from their lender? Um, so we're waiting on that guidance as well um, as some FTE rules. So needless to say, um, although many, many of us are anxious to get that forgiveness complete to then be able to recognize that revenue, we are waiting on a lot of pieces before we can get the right information out. So let's talk a little bit about timeline as well, like how long will it take once the application is provided or, or submitted to the lender? The lenders have 60 days from the time they receive the application to review and issue a decision to the SBA. That 60 day period, I know that like, for example, at my bank, we did receive some applications prior to the August 10th open date. Uh, according to the SBA, however, that 60 day period starts on August 10th or when the bank receives the application after the August 10th date. Then the SBA has 90 days to review and submit those resources back to the bank to pay off that forgiveness in full or partial. So that was another important piece in terms of timing of how that will affect recognizing that revenue. Um, one other question we get a lot in terms of timing is when do payments begin? And payments um, for the loans, if you submit a forgiveness application within 10 months of the, um, of the covered period, of the start date, I should say, um, then when that covered period ends, if you have not submitted an application for forgiveness, um, payments of interest and principal would begin then. If indeed an application is made um, prior to that 10 month period, you need to wait until the SBA sends their final uh, approval um, and uh, forgiveness amount. And at that point, any, re any uh, remaining um, loan amount or amount would be converted into a loan and then payments of principal interest would start at that time. So Leslie, I'll share, I'll send that back to you, but those are some guidelines in terms of timing that we're waiting on right now. Sure, thank you. Um, so just to reiterate, I think what I heard you say is that the interest wouldn't actually start accruing until well, later. It's not accruing currently, correct? Actually, interest does accrue from the time the loan was actually made. So, but the payments won't start until forgiveness is, is made. So for example, let's say um, their uh, um, application comes in and it's 100% forgiven. So there's no interest, there's no interest paid on that. The SBA will reimburse the lender for both. If a portion of the loan is not forgiven, that portion, the, the borrower is responsible for the principal and the interest from the date the loan was actually issued. So it retroacts back to the date that the loan was issued for that interest to calculate into the payments. Okay, great. And going back to maybe just a basic question, mm -hmm. um, how does an organization know when their um, loan period begins? Is it on the loan application or is it when they receive the funds? I know for folks that had the eight week period, it's a little yeah. tough to, to spend it in that time. So we're curious Absolutely. about that. So the, the start date is the date that the funds were received. So not necessarily when the loan was approved, mm -hmm. but when the borrower actually received the loan amount. That's when that's the, that's the date that it starts. Great. Um, and then let's see here. I also had a question about, I, I had heard, although I haven't spoken to anybody, that they were kind of rushing to forgiveness and trying to get their applications in. Is mm -hmm. there any particular reason? Is there, I assume that folks that have the loan and qualify for forgiveness will receive it. It's not necessarily a matter of timing because I think it's what, 10 months after the period that you have to actually mm -hmm. request the forgiveness. So that there's no, there's no, um, I know there was a big rush when we all went in and asked for the funds and we were afraid we wouldn't get them, sure. but it doesn't sound like that's also the case with forgiveness. Is that right? That is right, Leslie. So there is that 10 month period that uh, the borrower has to submit the application. So there is no rush per se. And with the extension of the covered period being eight weeks to 24 weeks, you may see some organizations continuing to use that or go to that 24 week period to utilize the bulk or all of their loan on payroll costs to make sure uh, that it is 100% forgiven. So there is definitely some time. There's no need to rush. And like I said earlier, many banks are not even accepting application at the applications at this moment. 
they may also um, go to a process of um, inviting their borrowers at certain periods of time to submit um, forgiveness applications. I would just recommend that um, everyone reach out to their lender, identify what their process will be and when they'll start accepting applications. And the key thing not to rush in as well is that as we're waiting on additional guidance um, and legislative um, changes, um, you know, there may be some that will be automatically forgiven with minimal paperwork and then some adjustments to paperwork as well. So it's there's still a lot that's in the up in the air um, that we should all be waiting for. Great. And then another sort of basic question that I think you have answered is um, if I elect the 24 week period, I can actually ask for forgiveness and apply for it before that 24 weeks is up, correct? That is correct. Absolutely. So even though you've selected or you're in the 24 week period time frame, if you used your funds in total at week 12, week 16, week 18, you're able to submit for forgiveness then. Great. And a couple of other things that I wanted to note for folks that um, are not necessarily bank related, but timing related, is that when you do receive that loan, it is on your balance sheet as a loan and it doesn't revert to grant revenue until it's actually forgiven. So that might actually straddle over your fiscal year. So one fiscal year, you might have a loan and look almost like, and you may actually have a, um, a negative budget at the end of the year, you might show a loss and then the next year show a gain because one year you receive the funds and expend them and the next year is when you actually recognize the revenue. So that might be a little a little tricky, which also um, brings me to the next point, which is some folks have uh, funder restricted, donor restricted grants that ha include some of those same expenses that the PPP loan covers. And you want to make sure that the timing of that is uh, not overlapping. So if you have, I would suggest if you have a grant, if your funder doesn't want to release the restrictions, that try to as much as possible put in the um, or expense to that grant as many direct expenses that the PPP loan would not cover. And then to make sure that whatever time period that grant is covering is not the same time period that you have in your PPP loan forgiveness packet. So I just wanted to point out a couple of other things. Um, and then I think we're good on timing, unless you have anything else on that, Lisa? Nope, that, work, that works. Great. Hey, Leslie, Leslie yeah. can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hey, Robert. Great. Yeah. Hey, everybody. We're so glad you're here, Robert. I, kinda, I think, I think uh, reiterating um, what Lisa had mentioned, I think most banks, um, uh, you know, are, are kind of waiting probably till I would say probably the end of the month. I mean, for First Interstate, uh, we're actually doing a test pilot um, right now using the uh, SBA's portal. Um, and so we're doing a test pilot this week with a handful of clients to kind of get, get up to speed, make sure it's working correctly. And I think if you talk to most banks, uh, a lot of banks are probably waiting again till the end of the month so i think from a you know between now and the end of the month i would just really and we can talk about it uh, in my section a little bit later about just getting your paperwork and information together um our bank you know our bank is actually going to be sending we will send emails out to uh all of our borrowers saying you know when we're ready to accept applications and i think a lot of bank bankers that i've talked to a uh, similar situation where you should, probably should get an email That'll say, you know, hey, we're we're open and ready to take your, you know, uh, application. Um, that being said, I mean, similar to you know what we saw on the on the front end of this, and I I know Lisa kind of tested it too. It was a mad mad dash, mad rush, and I think uh, it's, it's going to be kind of that way. Maybe as as you know things start out of the gates here, especially for folks that that know that they've already spent their, you know, spent their uh, loan money. Um, I think we'll probably see a big push on the front end. So, you know, I can't really tell you guidance wise whether you should go immediately or not. I know a lot of folks are anxious to get it forgiven, which I certainly understand, but uh, it's going to take, you know, take some time. And as Lisa mentioned, you know, even if you get the application in, it's a, it's a 60 day period for the banks to get, you know, get that processed and approved and submitted to the SBA. And then the SBA has 90 days uh, on top of that. So even if we, 
even if we got an application today, we're looking at potentially as long as you know, maybe five months to kind of get through the whole process. Okay, so just, I think that maybe just to reiterate what, what Robert was saying, so it's 60 days for the bank to make a decision, but then an additional 90 days for the SBA to process. Is that what I'm hearing? That's correct. So when when we get the application, then hopefully it would be 60 days, but on the front end, then we've got, you know, thousands of applications. So, um, so you know, if the bank processes it, the SBA hopefully processes it as well, but we're, we're basically submitting uh, the application um, after we've approved it, we're submitting the application for reimbursement, and the SBA um, has 90 days to kind of approve and, and send the money. So that's that's the timeline that we have currently. So Lisa, just to, correct me if I'm wrong. That's, is that your yep. understanding as well? Absolutely, that's that's the understanding we have. And so really, so um, folks would be waiting to hear once the bank hears from the SBA about forgiveness. You are not hearing directly from the bank. It's It could take even longer, but hopefully not, right? Okay, well, great. Well, thank you both for that. Um, the next topic that we're gonna cover are forgiveness amounts. And I believe that um, we have some subtopics here, but would we like, Lisa, would you like Robert to start with that? Sure. Go for it, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but I guess a couple, couple items there. Um, you know, as we talked, uh, as Lisa had mentioned, so you do have, if you if you did your loan before, uh, I think it's June 5th, um, you do have the option to elect an, an eight-week period uh, for, if you if you want to use that. So certainly, you know, keep in mind, I mean, you're, you're going to be limited by, you know, what you're original loan amount is, but uh, they did modify, um, you know, how much you can get reimbursed. Uh, you, it was going to be, um, originally it was going to be 75% of it had to be related to payroll and payroll and, and payroll and pen, payroll benefits. Um, that was reduced to 60%. Um, so, you know, if you, if you know you've got, you know, 100% of your dollars spent in payroll, then you're probably, you're probably not worried about you know, additional items such as, you know, interest, rent, utilities, and those items. Um, so that's that's probably the key thing on, on the amount side is uh, making sure that you, you're, you're spending at least 60% uh, or you have spent at least 60% of your uh, loan amount in uh, payroll and payroll benefits. Great. I have a quick question about that, Robert. Are there any types of benefits, like common benefits, that are not included? Um, I, I, I got to be honest with you. I'm not, I wouldn't be necessarily the expert on some of these odd, you know, odd type of benefits. But you know, for the most part, on the front end, um, you know, we, we were fairly, fairly liberal on sort of what that looked like in, in trying to get the loan amount uh, approved, and so. Um, you know, I would, I would I would say as you kind of put those together, certainly um, you can ask your banker or ask your you know CPA or you know potentially even your payroll company. We we saw at least you probably saw this as well, but you know a lot of the help and, and focus uh, came from the payroll companies, and, and so there was a lot of interaction to help the payroll companies provided um, you know a lot of our clients and a lot of our borrowers. So that's where I probably saw the most help, and and I think mm -hmm. the payroll companies you know. When they're putting together benefits and um, you know other you know other taxes and stuff related to that, again you can't you can't uh, cover federal you know federal tax with tax withholdings, but you can cover some state and other uh, withholdings as well. Um, but uh, so there there are, there could be some other odd payroll or medical benefits and things like that that I'm I'm not aware of. But you know every situation is different. Yeah, and I'll just, just add your. Oh. Sorry, Robert, to talk over you. I was just going to add that, um, yeah, I think we're both on the same page of, of uh, the different employee, uh, employer benefits that can be um, included into the payroll costs. One specific, and so that would include salary, tips, bonuses, you know, those type of things, uh, retirement contributions, um, any employee um, contributions to retirement that cannot be included. So it is um, employer driven uh, for those uh, payroll costs. Great. Um, so I also actually, since we're 
already talking about it. I have a quick question about the forgiveness process. So let's say that um, I have the 24 week, uh, I've selected that period and I submit it 17 weeks, but I've miscalculated. So somehow I haven't calculated something correctly, but I still have some time. Will I have an opportunity to put in like kind of appeal that or like, or is it just once it's done, it's done? Well, I can speak to um, our approach with our clients. Uh, we so the the borrower is responsible for calculating uh, the forgiveness and providing that information to the bank with the documentation to support it. What we are doing is we are uh, reviewing, like Robert said, also with the thousands of loans that they have, they'll be reviewing each one to determine how much the bank is going to um, um, approve for forgiveness and forward to SBA. Uh, we would most likely go back to our borrower. If we found a calculation or an error in the calculation, we would go back to our borrower and say, hey, we found this error. You may want to take a look at section X, Y, or Z and give them an opportunity to correct it before it gets submitted to SBA. Okay, great. So they might also have the opportunity to maybe withdraw right then if they realize they haven't spent all the funds and then, and then reapply for forgiveness later when they have everything lined up. I would think like. it would depend on the on the lender. So if if the borrower can have a communication with the lender, because you're right, you would want to make sure you have that cleared up before it goes to the SBA. Great, wonderful. Um, Robert, would you like to talk a little bit about the FTA or excuse me, FTE issues? They seem complex. Yeah, yeah, and, and again, uh, my disclaimer is, uh, you know, this. It continues to be there. I mean, there's all kinds of different scenarios out there. So I would say I'm not necessarily the the expert to drill down on that. But the the focus or guideline is really, you know, what was your, you know, what was your staffing, um, you know, prior to February uh, February 15th. And uh, so when you're when you're going in and spending your money, I mean, you, you basically have two two things you got to look at. One, you know, what are your FTE levels, and then, um, you know, have have you reduced uh, have you reduce salaries as well? So you have a limitation on reducing uh, salaries and uh, FTE by 25%, and to still qualify. Um, and so you know you're over. So with the extended time period, and again, this is my my understanding on it. We continue to hear variations and changes, but you know the focus uh, is to really try to get that staffing and that oh those payroll expenses back up to you know the level that you were prior to you know prior to February and kind of the whole COVID shutdown. Um, and I think it's, you know, the, the SBA has been fairly clear about saying, hey, if it was over 40 hours, that would count as, you know, one, one FTE. Um, if it's under 40 hours, that would count as a half FTE. So if you had, you know, if you had one full-time person in your nonprofit and you had also a half, you know, somebody who was doing 30 hours a week, technically, I guess you would have, you know, one and a half employees. Um, and the focus would be trying to get, you know, trying to get those folks hired back uh, within, you know, within the cover, within uh, a time time frame. So if that's 24, 24 months, um, and it actually, I may be, Lisa, you may know better, but I, I think you have till technically, I guess, the end of the year to get those levels back up. Is that correct? That is or correct. Is that before, you're, you're, yeah. yeah, you're spot on, Robert. It's December 31, so you're. If your um, FTE drops, uh, employee numbers drop, um, you do have until December 31 to raise those back up. Um, and there's a couple of safe harbors in place so that um, if uh, you had to uh, lay staff off and you made an attempt to hire them back or an equivalent position back and either your employee declined to come back or you couldn't find um, a, a an employee, an employee to come in at that level, um, then there's some safe harbors in place that will not penalize the borrower if they cannot return to that FTE level by December 31. I have another question about that. Um, so we all know how challenging it's been since the epidemic, um, 
since we've all been working from home and all sorts of things are changing in workplaces, if my organization, let's say, had you know 3.0 FTE and we've done some restructuring, so maybe we have different employees, but the wages are totally the same. But maybe a couple of people, instead of one FTE, I actually have two part-time people filling that position instead. Are they actually going to look at the individual staff members, individual staff um, salaries, or are they looking at as a whole? This is Robert. They're, they're actually looking at FTE, so they wouldn't necessarily drill down to, you know, a lot of, so a lot of our clients, you know, coming in from their payroll, they had, you know, let's say they had 10 employees with, and we have all the detailed information on, you know, what that looked like, but um, you're right. I mean, a lot of people have, you know, we've had folks retire, um, folks that have left, and so, you know, you, you've gone and, and hired other folks. So the reality is you're trying to replenish that FTE. So in, in your situation, as I mentioned before, if you've got, you know, if you had two, you had one employee that was over 40 hours, that person leaves and you have two employees now that are under 40 hours, you know, that could be equivalent to, um, you know, one FTE. So it is FTE driven from uh, my understanding. Great. And how about you, Lisa? Do you have anything to add to that? No, I agree. That's, that's how we interpret it as well. Great. But then the other piece is the, the, the compensation, right? So I think from a standpoint of making sure, again, this is, you know, think about it as driven, similar to your taxes, I mean, it's really focused, there's, there's a few exceptions to it, but it's really focused on what have you actually paid cash out of pocket on payroll costs and benefits and those items. Uh, those, are, those are the requirements for forgiveness. So, you know, when you put your paperwork together, you're really gonna have to drill down on what, on what I have spent. And so, um, and Leslie, you may have the different insights um, coming from the accounting side, but, you know, certainly cash you know, cash expenses paid versus accrued, um, that's a big thats a big topic of conversation with PPP, and um, I'm not the expert on that, but I get questions from our clients every day about, you know, how do I, if, if I've accrued, you know, bonuses, you know, does that count? And it's like, well, you have to, you actually have to show evidence of paying those, you know, cash items different than of the accrual side. So it's, it's a lot more like filing, your, you're filing on a cash basis with your taxes, I, that's how I kind of approach it and say, you have to show that you actually spent that during the year. I see. And where can folks find additional information on that? That That is a topic that I think is really also complex. You know, when when does your period start? When does it end? What if your payroll is once a month? What if it's every week? Um, what's the best way to find that actual detailed information? Robert or Lisa? Uh, there, there is there is some guidance. There is some guidance, uh, you know, on the FAQs and stuff on the FBA website. But uh, you know, <laughs> as we saw on the front end, it's, there's a lot of things that are still gray. I mean, I, I may read it one way, and you know, uh, somebody else may read it another way. So, um, you know, I think the best thing is, you know, if you probably talk to your talk to your accountant or CPA if you have a question between kind of the accrual and the, and the cash base piece of it. Yeah, I would agree. The FAQs are a good place, and of course, your your professionals, your CPAs and attorneys that are helping you out. Um, but in those FAQs, you can look at, or and in the guidance itself, you can look at the covered period versus the um, alternate cover alternative uh, payroll covered period. So there's um, different methods you can. You, there's those two different uh, periods you can select based on your payroll cycle, like you were saying, Leslie, earlier. Um, and I'll just Say, say as well that if there have been FTE reductions, um, extending the amount, so many of the loans were made with an eight-week period philosophy for the amount that was being requested early on. If those, if those employers have experienced FTE reduction, it's wise to take on the 24-week period instead to be able to, ex to extend those weeks to then, if there's a reduction in FTE, to use those extra weeks to continue to pay down um, uh, through payroll costs uh, to get to uh, closer forgiveness. Um, 
because 100% of the 100% of the loan can be used for payroll costs, so, and you don't necessarily need to uh, include the 40% of non-payroll. So um, that could be a good way for folks too who've had a reduction of FTE to be able to utilize as much of that amount as possible, if not 100% on payroll costs. Great. So then, um, so we have the 24 week and the eight week covered periods. And how would somebody decide which one to use, Lisa? What you know? What factors do you think they should think about? Yeah. So, um, like Robert said earlier, if um, a PPP loan was done before June 5th, that borrower was put into that eight-week period, that eight-week covered period. Uh, loans after that period automatically went into the 24-week period when that new guidance came out. So, um, if a borrower, a borrower, excuse me, um, had the loan done before June 5th, they can go ahead and elect the new 24 week period. Um, and my understanding is that they do not need to necessarily um, inform their lender of that. They just need to start um, uh, collecting information and data for that extended period of time. Um, but anyone after June 5th would be the 24 week period. So they can automatically um, assume that they have the 24 weeks to um, make those uh, to use those resources. Um, and like you said earlier, Leslie, if they use those full resources before the end of the 24 week period, they can apply for forgiveness. Then they do not have to wait until the end of the 24 week period to to apply for forgiveness. Okay, great. So. Um I'm also wondering about other things besides the FTE and the salary. What other CARES Act relief funding might affect somebody's or jeopardize even their forgiveness? I know there's EIDL loans, there, uh, there's the Employee Retention Act. Uh, what, what should folks be thinking about as, you know, I think especially at the beginning when we all didn't really know and we didn't have a lot of guidance from the SBA and we, really weren't sure what was going to happen going forward with funders, that folks kind of went for everything that they qualified for. So I'm just kind of wondering if folks have something that might jeopardize their forgiveness. Well, I will say that the um, the idle loan, um, the first 10,000 that was issued as a grant, so, you know, those those resources on the actual application for forgiveness, there is a place for the idle loan grant amount to be reduced from the amount of forgiveness. So there are some things in place in the current applications that we see today, which may change. And the disclaimer again, as we wait for additional guidance and legislative process to happen, that may change again. However, um, that would be reduced from the amount of forgiveness. Um, as far as um, the other um, options that, that that are out there, I would absolutely recommend speaking to um, uh, your tax consultant to really understand uh, all of the different benefits that we're taking advantage of and how that would play into forgiveness. And Robert, you may have um, some more guidance there for folks. Yeah, thank you. Um... You've got to be careful again. I mean, I'm, I'm not the expert on all the different uh, support and, uh, that the CARES Act provided for a lot of different industries. So that's that's something you got to be you know real careful of where there's not an overlap between sort of the the payroll forgiveness and uh, the PPP you know the PPP loan itself and the forgiveness. If you've got other sources, and I think Leslie you had mentioned early on, if if you've got a a grant that's you know uh, basically paying payroll for a program. Um, you've got to figure out sort of how, you know, you can't, you can't double dip on that, right? So if you're getting paid from a grant, um, you know, that would really not, technically uh, would not necessarily be something that would be paid by a PPP loan and forgiven. So you got to be really careful about overlap there. And we've seen it in a few, you know, a few conversations with our, a few of our clients on, you know, if they've got funds or sources, you know, coming into pay those payroll costs, um, that's where you're really going to probably drill down uh, on those type of uh, situations when, you know, when the bank goes through its approval process, but all, also the SBA goes through its approval process, make sure there's, you know, they're, they're not borrowing money for something that they've already got reimbursed from, an, from another, um, either another source, government source, or even a, 
uh, you know, independent funder or something like that. And that's especially important, obviously, on the nonprofit side. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so our next topic is uh, the paperwork. We all love paperwork. Um, so the paperwork that folks need to get together to be ready to request forgiveness. Uh, and Robert, do you want to walk us through that? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start off. Um, you know, a couple things. Um, you know, again, keep in mind. I mean, there's going to be different processes on how this is put together, and and uh, uh, most banks. I mean, a lot of banks are actually. You know, our our bank, for example, is working with Fiserv. Fiserv is our um, kind of our loan deposit, you know, core platform, and so Fiserv has a a portal that you know we're going to be using, so that our clients can actually take their paperwork. You know, sub, uh, submit the application, forgiveness application, and then upload the backup or payroll information. Um, so that that's probably the key thing. You know, making sure uh, you as a borrower understand sort of you know what what your bank's process is going to be, because every, every bank is going to be a little potentially a little bit different. Um, a lot of the big a lot of the big banks probably have some kind of a proprietary system or something that they're going to be utilizing. Um, you know, the, the big banks like Chase and Wells and some of those, I can't speak for what they're going to be using, but I, I'm sure they'll have some kind of uh, platform to accept, um, you know, the paperwork as well. Um, I think the big, you know, probably the big question that's sort of up in the air currently is, you know, which, you know, which application, forgiveness application do I use? Um, they're both, you know, 3508 is the application, and there's also an easy application. Currently, um, you know, currently the easy application is really focused on those people who uh, apply for a PPP loan as a who self-employed, self-employed, independent contractors, um, sole proprietors with no, you know, with no employees, and a, and a lot of those, if you remember on the early on, a lot of those sole proprietors and independent contractors uh, were not allowed to submit applications till later in the process. Um, but you know th those are technically the ones that are qualified to be able to submit you know currently the 3508 easy form. Um, although as Lisa had mentioned previously, the you know what's been presented to Congress you know basically is you know trying to be able to utilize um, that easy form for any loan amounts up to 150,000. Um, so that we're all I think we're all hopeful, especially on the banking side, and that. Uh, that will apply, so it's just going to be a, hopefully more streamlined. There's even been conversation, as Lisa al alluded to as well, where there might just be an, like a one-page uh, attestment that you've spent the money and you get forgiven. So we'll, we'll see if that actually rolls out. But um, so the, anyways, the easy form will be really focused on now on independent contractors, but we're hopeful it expands and, and applies to loans up to 150. Um, and then if it's above 150, you, you would use the the regular form, which they've modified two or three times. Originally, it was like a pretty complex, you know, 11-page form, and I think they've streamlined that uh, a couple times. Um, certainly, if, if you're aware of it and you've got a loan that's over $2 million, um, and I know there's quite a few you know, larger nonprofits uh, that may, may have applied for a loan over $2 million, um, that's going to be a little bit more complicated process where um, – you know, the, the, we'll, we'll go through the process on the bank side, but there'll actually be a further review um, by the U.S. Treasury uh, on those larger loans. So, um, if you have a larger loan, you know, over two million, um, it's going to take some more additional legwork and additional, uh, you know, focus on on what the Treasury is going to look at on the approval uh, process. Um, but I think gathering your information, I mean, that's fairly straightforward. Again. You think back on you know you had to gather your information for you know for the loan application and um, you know it would be similar information. Hopefully your payroll payroll provider, if you're using one, can provide a lot of the detail or information that you're looking for. You know other items that you can get forgiven for uh, are rent, uh, mortgage interest, utilities. Um, so there's a lot of other things that you can add on. The reality is a lot of, I think, I mean, we'll see what it looks like when we roll it out, but a lot of companies we've been talking to um, and, and organizations we've been talking to seem to feel pretty comfortable that they can spend, you know, the money over the 24-week period. Again, the loan amount, um, loan sizing was based on eight weeks of uh, payroll costs, 
and um, a few other items. And so if you figure, you know, if you're able to hire back some of those people, you got three times as much payroll um, that you can cover in that 24-week period versus the eight-week period. So most of our clients may wind up wind up using, um, you know, 100% of their uh, forgiveness will be focused just on payroll, and they won't have to add these other items on. But I guess we'll we'll see that um, as things roll out. Uh, it, it's interesting, and when we originally set up this uh, WebEx or a webinar. Um, you know, our thought process is we would have all the answers and we'd have, you know, anecdotal experience on, you know, hey, here's what we, here's the loans we've forgiven over the last, you know, or approved to forgive over the last month. And uh, we're still, we're still not there yet. And we're probably still another month out before we actually have detailed hands-on anecdotal information about what we're seeing. Um, but, uh, you know, again, be patient, but uh, be organized. And, and I would just make sure you've got everything as detailed as possible um, when you're kind of putting your paperwork together. Um, and Lisa, I don't know, you know, kind of what your process will be or if you're, you're uh, rolling that out, sounds like here in the next couple of weeks as well, kind of how are your banks focused, but I've heard various banks are using some kind of automated portal to allow folks to put the application in and, and, and upload their, you know, backup information. Yeah, we're um, we're we're definitely um, streamlining our process, and we're um, inviting our clients of a certain size to come in and and uh, once we have further guidance on exactly what we're doing, so we're, we're pausing just a moment until we have some more legislative um, uh, guidance and and final rules. But um, we will be like many banks, inviting our clients of a certain size to start the process with us. We have. I want to say we have about 30 applications that um, our clients have already sent in um, early that we're really um, anxious to get through the forgiveness process. So we're working with them now as we know some of the, the, the most current rules of, well, let's work on getting some more information from you. Um, so based on, you know, look, thinking about what documentation you need, uh, like Robert said, there, you should think about it through three different aspects, really. Payroll documentation, FTE documentation, and then non-payroll cost documentation. And all of those should support what you're, what you're putting in into your, into your forgiveness application. So if you're including, so whatever document, whatever numbers you're including in that application, you need to make sure you have those documents supporting it. And again, uh, hopeful that um, those loans under 150,000 will have some sort of automatic forgiveness that will have a one pager or something as Robert alluded to, but um, just keep in mind that you're keeping track of all of those receipts or documents or uh, reports from your payroll company to be to um, to submit those with your um, with your application when the time is right. Great, wonderful. I know I'm noticing um, a lot of the questions that are coming in are very specific. They really want to know exactly what type of documentation, and it sounds like that's maybe a little bit up in the air or that we're waiting to hear from the SBA that we might see some um, blanket forgiveness documents that might make things a little bit easier. But I'm going to assume that, you know, those three areas, um, the payroll, the FTE, and the non-payroll, particularly the non-payroll, would be something like the invoice you receive from your um, landlord, as well as the check showing that you've paid it. So like both sides of a transaction is what I'm going to assume that you'll be looking at. Uh, Leslie, that's what we're assuming as well. So copies of invoices, copies of payments that were made. Um, if it's a mortgage interest payment, um, you know, maybe uh, receipts from those or an amortization schedule from your lender showing what those payments were. For utility payments, or, or I should say rent payments, also a, a rent or lease agreement with receipts or canceled checks. I mean, there's different ways. And I think every, even though every bank or lender is going to require the backup data, um, you know, there may be differences between lenders of what they want. Um, but again, I think part of what we're waiting for with, with uh, the current um, bill that's in front of Congress has some form of um, streamlined documentation approach as well. So unfortunately, it is a wait and see at the moment, um, but just keep track in those three categories is what I would suggest. Well, here, here's the million dollar question that I keep seeing come up here um, in the Q&A section is, when do we think we're going to hear about that? <laughs> that is a million dollar question. I'll let, I'll let 
I'll let I'll let Lisa answer that. I'm sure she has a specific time. <laughs> In the hot seat when, here. When um, <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, we're just hopeful that it'll happen sooner than later. Um, the same um, legislation is tied up with um, extending um, additional coverage to um, whether it's unemployment coverage or, I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff right now sitting in front of Congress waiting for a decision. Um, I, we're just hopeful it, could, it will be any day, but um, your guess is as good as mine. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, so I actually have another question around that. So I know the SBA, once they have guidance from Congress on what the expectations are, they issue their guidelines on how banks and borrowers, are there any um, topic items that have been clarified by Congress that the SBA is just now getting to? So is there anything that we are expecting the SBA to give us different guidelines on, as, you know, if everything were to remain the same as it is today? I'm not in. Um, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not aware yeah, of anything. Okay. Uh, Same here. There was just a new FAQ that came out, um, I believe, yesterday from SBA. Um, and as I read through the FAQ, the new FAQ, um, there were still um, uh, answers that they had provided previously, just a little more explanation. So there was nothing new that I that I saw or that I would expect. Great. Wonderful. Um, so I'm, I've been looking through the questions, like I said, that are coming in, and a lot of them are specific. You know, what what can I do if it's if I'm on a monthly payroll and a few things like that. But one of the other things that I'm seeing here is a little bit of concern around the FTE requirement for folks that have had to either shut down or really pull back from their services. So would is there any safe harbor for folks that maybe just their actual deliverables and business has shrunk and so they've also shrunk their staffing is there any safe harbor for that in the forgiveness process there are two separate safe harbors that that we're aware of um, right now um, that uh, for um, let me just I'm going to I'm going to read a little bit of, of, of about them here. Um, so basically, one of them is if a borrower in good faith um, is able to document they're unable to operate between February 15 and the end of the covered period that they select or that they have at the same level of, of activity that, that they were able to perform before February 15, 2020. And this would be due to. Uh, compliance with requirements by the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, the Director of Center of Disease Control and Prevention, or um, OSHA, um, then there are safe harbors if they're unable to uh, operate the same level based on specific conditions. And I would recommend that you look into the specific language of um, that safe harbor. So that would be um, that would be one. The second one um, is if uh, the borrower reduces its FTE uh, levels uh, in the in the period beginning April 15, 2020, and ending April 26. But the borrower was able to restore that FTE levels no later than December 31, 2020. Then there's some safe harbors in place there as well. Um, but it would have. But I would really recommend uh, researching those safe harbors and seeing how they specifically interact with the condition of that organization. And Robert, I'm not sure if you have anything you would want to add to that. Yeah, there's some, uh, and, and the good part about the extended, you know, time frame, uh, you know, originally, you know, I think that the big panic was, you know, how, how can we hire people back when we can't even, you know, leg legally we're not allowed to mm -hmm. even start hiring people back or open and open a location. Um, so I think adding the, the, the 24 week period and also, you know, allowing until the end of the year to kind of get your staffing back up 
you know, does provide quite a bit of, of, of help and flexibility. And I, again, the, you know, the safe harbor items, that's, those are gray, gray areas. Um, there are some, as Lisa said, there are some uh, exceptions on the safe harbor where if you really made an effort to try to hire the person back and you couldn't, um, I think there, I, I think I read at one point there was a, if, if somebody was fired for cause, maybe you wouldn't have to, you know, restore that position on FTE wise. So, um, there's a lot of unique situations and I'm sure every, you know, everybody on this, uh, webinar has their own unique situation where they've got to figure out sort of how does this apply. Um, what, what I have seen though, is a lot of people, you know, there, there's a lot of concern about the FTE piece. I mean, the expenditure piece, I think most people probably figure they're going to be able to, you know, cover those expenses given that there's a 24, 24 weeks versus eight weeks. But that FTE one's maybe a little bit more of a challenge on how you, you know, how you get back up to that level. Um, and so, you know, that, that there'll be more, you know, scenarios on that. And again, I, I think from an anecdotal standpoint, um, we probably won't see those for, for a while because obviously if folks haven't been able to rehire the way that they wanted to to ask for forgiveness, I would assume probably those borrowers are going to wait later and later into the year um, to see if they get their staffing levels back up. Great. Wonderful. Um, Allison, are you noticing any other questions that we should be addressing at this point? Thanks, Leslie. There are so many questions that came in to the Q&A, um, and, and like you said earlier, some of them are very, very specific. Um, and so before before I answer the question you just asked, I'm wondering if um, Lisa and Robert, would you have somebody on your team who'd be willing to work with me to kind of help group these questions and point people to the right guidance? Um, since we're not going to get to everybody's specific questions, if we could work on that, um, just throwing it out there to yeah. see. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Happy to. Okay. I think that will be really helpful. I don't want you all going back to your work day wondering if you're going to get some support and guidance on these questions. Um, and I heard um, in your dialogue a lot of these areas got covered, but it might be hard for people to kind of apply it to their situation, their specific situation. So um, I saw uh, quite a few people um, liked questions around double dipping, and Robert, you spoke about double dipping a little bit, but can you talk about that a little bit more? And I'm just going to read really quickly. It says, um, you know, uh, the issue in some, oh, sorry, what are the SBA rules? Does it really apply to both foundation grants and government uh, grants and contracts or just government revenue streams? So just maybe a quick uh, review of, of what you were uh, tapping into when you talked about double dipping. Well, well, again, I mean, I think the, you know, the focus there is to say, hey, we're, we're trying to keep, you know, keep folks employed and, and we're going to pay, you know, we're going to pay it for that with the PPP uh, loan pro program. So if there is an ongoing, again, I'm, you know, again, I'm saying this as with a qualifier there, I'm not the expert on every grant or, um, and, and how it, you know, how it works in your specific situation, but I do know there, if you go back and look at the FAQs, there's, some pretty specific language about not, you know, not being able to, um, you know, show, I guess, uh, you know, expenditures if you're getting paid from another source that has not changed. So I just, that's why I say double dipping. If you're, if you are getting, you know, a grant, grant's probably the best way to show that if you're getting uh, paid payroll, you know, from a grant um, and you're getting that covered, you know, typically you'd have to show that you know you're not getting covered by that in the down period to be able to kind of use those uh, use those uh, payroll dollars for forgiveness, and that's that's kind of my understanding of it. Again, I'm not I'm not the accounting or tax you know, expert on it, but that's um, that's my understanding. I'm sure I'm sure Annie O and and Jim and, and some of the folks there probably. I, I know Jim is sort of so close and, and tied into a lot of. Uh, in a lot of these questions that we probably have some better guidance, you know, from a, uh, from an overall standpoint for NAO than, you know, me or Lisa, you know, kind of giving our insights in a, in a somewhat gray area. And like I said, every, every, every client has a unique situation. So right, <laughs> trying to navigate right. through those has been our challenge. Right. Well, thank yeah. you for that. And, oh, go ahead, Leslie. Allison, oh. I'll just this is Lisa. I'll just add um, to Robert what Robert's saying. A couple of um, things that I've shared with my clients that have government grants for for payroll costs is I 
I've said, hey, go back to your grant, review what that covers and the time frame in which it covers, because it could be that you can still use the proceeds and not overlap. Um, but Robert's absolutely right, just that all of the FAQs, all the information says double dipping is not, is not allowed. And I would much rather a nonprofit take better care of the grant resources that are coming in, especially if it could be a recurring grant. You don't want to jeopardize that grant moving forward because you have PPP funding today. So um, I would encourage, you know, taking a look at your grant, making sure that you're not overlapping, use what you can when you're not overlapping. And if that means at the end of the period, you don't get 100% uh, forgiveness because you were assuming you'd be able to use that as well as your grant, then you have an opportunity Opportunity at the end. If you do not want to take a loan amount that's not forgiven, that can be paid back to your lender. So um, I would just take extra care with the grant cycle to make sure you're not jeopardizing a future grant. Okay, great. Thank you, Lisa. And with that, we are right up against time. Leslie, were there any final thoughts that you wanted to share before I wrap things up? Um, I, I don't have anything specific. I, I did hear what you were mentioning that we would be able to, and what I understand is that we'll be able to answer some questions or direct folks to where they can get some answers. As we know, this is a really changing, constantly changing uh dynamic for us all with the PPP loans and it has been since the beginning. So it's nothing new, uh -huh. but hopefully as we go into forgiveness, we're going to be a little bit more specific and be able to get folks through that process. Right. And at NAO, we'll continue to monitor and put out our regular policy updates. And we're expecting that we will probably have to do another PPP loan forgiveness session as we roll into September and wait for this additional guidance and decision making to happen um, at the federal level. So um, stay tuned. Um, we will take all of the um, questions in the Q&A and follow up with um, Lisa and Robert's teams. Um, I want to thank our presenters and I want to thank Leslie for joining us today and sharing your perspectives and expertise and a big thank you to our funders, sponsors and members. And be sure to check out uh, NEO's uh, just released compensation and benefits report that we sent out yesterday in alert. And um, I hope that you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks.